go into the book of Judges, chapter 6. I want to introduce you to what's possible if you will make yourself available. How many knows that when you go into prayer, he's right there? But can I invert that? How many times has he needed somebody? Are we available? Miraculous instruction breeds supernatural experience. What we're about to read and talk about today you have to let it leap off the page into your heart and mind and open the door for God to do for you what he can do and not be limited by ourselves. Are you with me? Verse 6, and Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt. I brought you forth out of the house of bondage. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. And then all of a sudden, that supernatural, miraculous work of God manifests itself. And it, there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an Oprah. That pertained unto Joash the Abizarite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, the mighty man of valor. Now, I know most of you have heard this story before, but I behoove you to know that there's something here for you today. If you won't just let this just be another service, you will get something from this today. Let's go before the Lord Jesus. We need you. Help us. Allow your word to go forth into the fertile soil of our souls that we may truly glean a harvest in our walk with you, God. Speak to us clearly. Lord, allow me to bring forth this word under the anointing of your power. I don't want to waste anybody's time, God. But I'm praying right here, right now, for who this is for, God, that they will get it with both hands, with their whole heart and their whole mind. And everybody said in Jesus' name. God bless you. You can be seated. I was really touched in the middle of this week, and I had... Tremendous amount going on, and right in the middle of the heat of everything, and this is how God works, he starts hitting me with this. And forgive me, I'll be transparent. I'm like, God, everybody's heard about Gideon. It's not new. It's not fresh. It's not revelatory. <laughs> and I guess, and it's kind of strong, but I guess I got a, a little bit of a, a rebuke. So today I want to give context to the condition of God's people. Because if you listen to the final words that God breathed into this book, book of Judges, it says, In those days Israel had no king. But it describes us today, it describes many people that have been around the things of God for a long time, and we start to take the will of God, the word of God, 
with a little tongue in cheek and we become kind of callous because it says, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. I don't need leadership. I have no expectation. Well, with no leadership and no expectation leads to no victory and returning to bondage. Now, honestly, I am going to use some bad words today. Words like obedience. Words like submission. Words like humility. But understand that even though this is an Old Testament story, the Lord saw fit to let us know, according to the book of Romans 15 and 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Anybody, anybody have any hope today? Anybody know that, you know, God is so great that no matter your situation, he can do something. The reality of it is today is that it's up to each and every one of us to glean from scripture what we have to have to grow in God. To improve today better than we were yesterday. To open the idea and become who and what God has called me to be. If, if, if an elderly man, 75 years old, can birth and be the father of many nations. If a young child can be born to save humanity, none of us in the wisdom and the power and the will of God are beyond the miraculous. First Peter 2 and 9 lets us know, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Understanding thou that as we open the book of Judges in chapter 6, God's people have been suffering oppression for seven years at the hands of the Midianites. Understand it was their lackadaisical attitude or just their pure disobedience that brought this on. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites were forced to leave their homes. And if you go back and read the story, for which I will not do, because I'd like to get you out of here. Well, you got time to get a nap to be back for tonight. But they were forced to leave their homes. The Bible says that they were living in dens and caves just to escape persecution. Each year at the harvest, the Midianites, along with their allies, would come in charging from the desert, cross the Jordan River and take all the food and the grain that they could carry and that out of spite would burn and not leave anything. You ever feel like your life just got burned out? You ever feel like you just never seemed to get ahead? Seven years. I wonder how long it took for them to cry out to the Lord. They cried out because of Midian. Midian was their problem that day. What's your Midian today? What's your Midian? What's keeping you from that close walk with the Lord? What's keeping you from your spiritual victory? What's keeping you from walking in the fire of the Holy Ghost? What's keeping you from being used of God? They cried out to God for deliverance. To cry out for deliverance means you're crying out for a victory over something. Today, it's talking about spirituality. How, to get victory over Midian today would become to become spiritual, to become on fire, to be that, that, that minister of flame of fire, to become someone that others can go to for direction, for inspiration, because you have a walk with God. What's keeping you from your anointing today? What's keeping you from your calling? What, what's got you ducking and hiding in defeat? You will not find spirituality in the movies. 
You will not find a close walk with God in TV or on Facebook. You will not find the will and the word of God in your favorite music or radio station. Now, I find that I find I call I, I'm kind of in this thrust into this element here because in verse eight, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. They cry out to God for deliverance. He sent them what? Yep. God sent a preacher. Isn't that an all shucks moment? You just wanted a supernatural answer to bust through into your life and walk along and you find that winning lottery ticket. Someone hands you a brand new car or just out of nowhere, someone you didn't even know died and you just didn't hear it. See, see, you're looking for those kind of miracles, but oftentimes the miracle God's trying to send you will come walking up in shoe leather. First Corinthians remind us, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. How many of you are just thinking yourself right out of God's will? And it pleased God by the foolishness of a preaching to save them that believe. They cried out for help and God sent a preacher. I'm pretty sure they were hoping he'd send them something else. Send us an army. We'd like to turn and whip on these boys a little bit the next time they show up. Send a plague. Hit them with a plague, God. Can we see a lightning bolt come down? And Come on, some of y'all have been so mad at people. Let us let a lightning bolt come down and strike that car. Come on, you're asking for a miracle. But instead, they got a preacher and a sermon. Is that a revolt in development? But if you understand and you listen, God, as he always does, first gave them what they needed and not what they wanted. You see, he sent them a prophet because it was more important that Israel understand what led to their current problem and situation and predicament. See, we just want deliverance from it without understanding, but God wants to give you understanding so you don't go there again. <laughs> Immediate deliverance wasn't as important as the understanding. You see, at times, understanding a problem and how we got there is actually more important than eliminating the problem. He wants you to turn. A lot of times, we tell God to, we tell God to move. We ask God to move. Our prayer is asking God to do something. But most of the time, it's our turn. It's our turn. That matters. Are you hearing me? We have to learn to turn to God. We're running from God with all our proclivities and all our desires and chasing all our things. And he's like, it's, it's not like I'm far away, but it's your turn. It's time to turn, folks. Turn to God means you're turning away from what has been keeping you from him, what's been keeping you busy, what's been distracting you, what's been diluting you. Has God ever done that to anybody here tonight, today? So we have an unnamed prophet, preacher, that delivers a message from God. <laughs> this is what the Lord God of Israel says. God reminds his people of all that he had done for them in the past. You ever been in a conversation with someone and they got to bring up the past? It bothered a fire out of you? God doesn't mind reminding you and bothering you a little bit. Some of us have forgotten how far God has brought us. And we get a little outside of ourselves thinking, do you think he forgot? He reminds them of how gracious and merciful he's been. You are not a slave. I got you out of Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians who oppressed you and beat on you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. And I told you I'm your Lord. I'm your God. 
God is reminding them, I've had a special relationship with you. I've been all in with you from the get-go. I've done this. I've done that. I chose you. I made a covenant with you. I'm, I am your God and you are my people. And then he kind of shits it. And you knew what I expected from you. Isn't that funny? Anybody got expectation from God today? I do. I do. Oh, but is he allowed to expect from us? Because he said, don't worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now. Careful, Americans. Don't worship the God of the Americans. Don't wa worship at the the opulence of America. Oh, you got the nice house and you got the nice car and you got the life insurance and you got health insurance and you got car insurance and you got anything and everything. You have need of nothing. And pretty soon you got a greater relationship with America than you do with the Holy One of Israel. You knew that God wants his relationship to be exclusive. That he was to be your only God and you were to bow to no one or nothing except him. And he reminds him, but you didn't listen. You got all caught up. Sermon over. Altar call. There was no fluffy story to get appeal to your feelings. There was no emotional tug that was put out there to make you emotionally weep to compel you emotionally to an altar? Because when it comes to living for God, you're going to have to make a cerebral decision to say, I'm going to change my heart and I'm going to turn. I'm going to change what I've been thinking. I'm going to change what I've been in love with. I'm going to change what I've been doing. I'm going to change some things because it's my turn. It's my turn to turn. Now, the text does indicate what kind of effect the message had on the people. But the purpose was blatantly obvious. To bring them to repentance. You know, this just ain't getting better, is it? First, I get told off. There's no emotional story to help me get in the state of mind that I need to be to repent. And then it calls me to repentance. Well, I just don't feel like repenting right now. Preacher better do a better job. But you have to understand what we learn because this, like, this is to teach us. Repentance precedes deliverance. You want to see the miraculous. You want deliverance, but don't ask me to repent, God. I ain't got no sin in my life. I ain't doing anything wrong. Yeah, like that arrogance is okay. You see, you don't understand that thing that you shy away from, that thing that your arrogance, human, understand, don't lose out with human arrogance because when this body dies, it'll be gone, trust me. Be careful that you don't make this flesh so important because one of these days it's going to die and you're going to be stuck with the results of listening to it. Because repentance is what? It's turning. God's saying turn. It's time to turn. It's your turn. He was, he's never not been all in. He's never not been gracious. He's never not been there for us. So if there's a problem, it's not his turn, it's our turn. What's keeping you from going all in? What's keeping you from really turning and deciding to be a different you. What, what's stopping you from repenting from all this behind you and making today a new day and a new you? Let me ask it this way. What is keeping you from turning all in with God? Mm -hmm. What is it? Is what's keeping you from God worth what it's going to cost you? Maybe there's deliverance for you today. Maybe there's ministry in your future because of your conduct. 
Maybe there's an anointing that you never had before. Maybe there's salvation. May, maybe there's an intimacy with God and his word and the Holy Ghost power that you never had before. And it's merely a turn away. It's right around the corner, in other words. It's, it's just a turn away. Can I, can I stop being loyal to your dysfunction? Can I put it a little plain today? Stop giving yourself to what's destroying you. Stop saying loyal to the things that have been ripping from you an intimate walk with God. Stop lending yourself to what's depleting you. Stop being faithful to what's hurting you. Stop being faithful to chemicals and dependency. Stop being faithful to secret sins. Stop being faithful to the Midians in your life. Stop being faithful to the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Can, can, can we say that today? Can, 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 we, can, we say, can we say, wait a minute, God, I've I gotten a little bit over my skis. I've I kind of been walking around. I, I, you, you got me out of the world, and now I wear a suit on Sundays, and who oh, I've arrived now. I, I, you got me a good job, and we're set now, and everything's good. I, 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 never, I, never, I never did anything or got the education to get where I am, but oh, my God, I'm here. I don't want to take credit for that, God. So I want to break this story down a few <sighs> If you were asked to list some of the common characteristics of a person who would be likely to be a hero or a deliverer, what kind of things would you list? Someone is strong, courageous, confident, skilled, determined, selfless, and prepared. To, to, to name a few, is that all right? And if we're talking about being a hero for God, probably have to add faithful to that list. Consistent, faithful. Are you hearing me? And you know, I, I'm not sure how many of us would list the following characteristics to be a hero for God, but fearful, bitter, insecure, stubborn, timid, inexperienced. But if you understand, as we will see as we look at Gideon's story, every one of those unlikely hero words could find themselves to describe Gideon when we first meet him. So sometime after the prophet We read, and there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which is in Oprah, that pertained to Joash, the Abizarite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midians. Any time in the Old Testament when you see the expression angel of the Lord, it's called a theophany. It's a compound word made up of two words that mean to show God. And several times in the Old Testament, God would appear directly to an individual taking on a human-like form, a form that, though visible, was not actually human flesh. So, okay, God is appearing to a guy named Gideon, and at this point, we, we don't know much about him, but some of the things I described we find were there because he's at the bottom of a wine press. What's he doing? He's threshing wheat. He's separating grain from the plant matter. The text says that Gideon was in a wine press threshing wheat. The, the Hebrew verb used here expresses the idea he's hiding. Where am I going with this? Just listen. A wine press was usually carved out of stone, and it normally had two cisterns or areas carved out, and one would be slightly lower than the other, and often underground. The upper area was where they would pour in the, the grapes and tread, out, tread on them, and as the liquid rose to a certain height, it would pour into the lower vat where the wine would be stored. And so here's 
Gideon in one of these giant cisterns threshing wheat. These things were large enough to where a man could be in there hiding. If you think about it and you think about the context of what's going on here, he was probably in the lower one hiding to not only be physically hidden, but to hide the sound that he would probably be making. He did this so the enemies could not find him and take his food. Now, I've never threshed wheat before, but from what I read, from what I've learned, threshing wheat usually works best when you're out in the open and you've got some wind helping you out. To thresh wheat, Brother Joe, you've got to have wind. You see, trying to thresh that wheat without the benefit of the wind is going to take a lot of extra effort. It doesn't work very well. It, it probably was a pretty difficult struggle, and you can probably only do it just a little bit at a time. And I see an analogy here for the church. I see an analogy for some folks. Too many times the church tries to do the very same thing. You're a covert Christian. Nobody really knows you're a Christian because you're in hiding. You're hiding in your own version of the wine press, attempting to do God's work without the wind of the Spirit. How many folks are hiding out uh, without the power of the Holy Ghost in their life? How many people, you show up and you go down into your secret hold because you really don't want anybody to take what you got. When's the last time you felt the mighty rushing wind of the Holy Ghost flow through your life to blow out the chaff and assist you in getting your life cleaned up, getting your attitude cleaned up, getting your spirit cleaned up so God could use you in a powerful way? Mm -hmm. Come on, somebody. Why don't you just go ahead in the quiet stickiness of this moment that this preacher with this unwelcome sermon without a gentle little story to prod you to the altar, turn to your neighbor and ask them, how long's it been since the wind of the Holy Ghost was working in your life? But well, won't ask them. Little interaction today. How long's it been since you spoke in tongues? How long's it been? since you found yourself yielded to God and allow the Holy Ghost to move through your life. Change your mind. Change your attitude. Change your thinking. Change your heart a little bit. How long's it been? I'll tell you what, that was so sticky, ask him again. Go on, ask him. Ask him. You better hear me. I ain't up here entertaining nobody. God sent me to talk to somebody today. You, I, I, you better know what's on the line. Y'all praying, God, use me. Are well, you ready to come out of your hall? Oh, God, I want to feel the power of the Holy Ghost. You ready to change your attitude? Oh, I want people to respect me. Are you ready to repent? I'm showing up at church. Yeah, but you're ducking the wind. Oh, I'm sorry. Shucks. Should I get on a different... You know I can go Joel Osteen on you and tell you we're all good and going to heaven and it's apple pie and sky and lie to you. I've been around some of you enough that you won't actually tell me to lie to you, but you want me to tell you you're doing all right. Let me ask you this. Is the wind blowing in your life? Is it blowing out the chaff or are you holding on to it down in your little hole? You got your own little world. You got your own little house. You got your own little temple. And bless God, that preacher ain't going to come preach a sermon to me. And if he does, bless God, he better put a good story on there and make me feel emotional. You may race with your legs, but you run this race with your mind. See, the problem with you is a little bit like Gideon. We got some stubbornness. You, you want to go on who you used to be instead of who you are today. Some of you got some Midians in your life. 
You got some stuff in your life and you're hiding and it's costing you the power of the Holy Ghost. Now let's let's get to the practical side. Holy Ghost, Gideon's heart was pounding as he was hit away threshing. Come on, man, he's ducking people that want to hurt him. He didn't want anybody to hear him. And then all of a sudden, he's just joking. Gideon didn't expect him to hear a sound. The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. I know, I know some of y'all ain't heard God talking a long time because you got no more reverence about the things of God. There's no more trepidation. The Bible talks about those that tremble at that is word. Ooh, can you imagine if we had a revival of trembling? At a, see, you see you, what you think and what our opinion is and what the world says and this, this newfangled, what they call Christianity. We revere that because it makes us feel good. But feeling good ain't the same as being good. Being right is not righteousness. Some of you are stuck on being right, but you're not righteous. Some of you are so proud that you got some rightness in your life. But the problem is your attitude towards your attitude towards the church, your attitude towards people, your attitude is not righteousness. Oh, you need to hear me. I could go down that road, but that, that, that's coming up in a week or two. Stick around. What do you think Gideon's first thoughts were when he heard those words? I mean, maybe after he was done screaming and tucking his shirt back in. <laughs> Listen, church, I'm not here to beat anybody up. God saw something in Gideon that Gideon did not see in himself. And many times it's going to take a word from God to get you to realize God's got something for you. But the problem is you're so busy holding on to what you think you got that you never get to have what he has for you. I'm not trying to call anybody out to hurt you. I'm calling, I'm trying to call something real. Like God's got something better for you than what you settle for. But it's time for you to turn. It's time for you to make the turn. I believe. What we say about Gideon could be said of us today. Because the truth is when you look at yourself, we don't see a masterpiece. We don't see ourselves as God sees us. And we're so busy trying to look at what we look and become what we like that we miss what he's called us to. And so Gideon replies like we do. Well, Lord, if you're with us, why is all this happening to me? Can I get an, can I get an honest amen? Amen. Well, God was so cared about me, why did I go through that? So here's where the bitter comes out. What about all the, where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? What about this bringing us out of Egypt stuff? But now the Lord's abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. If you pay close attention, God doesn't even gratify any of that with an answer. Maybe God's silent is because he ain't going to answer all your mess. Maybe God stopped moving and stopped answering and stopped talking because all you are is bitterness complaining about how you think things should be because you're caught up in, with your angst towards the Lord. Now, I know ain't none of you ever got there. I know y'all happy as peas in a pod, clam at high tide, whatever analogy you want to put there. But me, I, I've kind of had a set two with God now and then. Anybody else want to admit they've been accusatory of God? Instead of honest about our self-imposed distractions, drifting from his commands and creating, creating our own religion and our own way because we've just ascended to a height in our own eyes that, well, you know, God, I think I've been around here long enough. I can question you. I can question, you know, I can question the man of God. I, I've read my Bible. How many of us have started leaning on our own understanding and really simply lost touch with his word, being faithful and obedient, believing and serving? The Lord didn't answer him. He simply said to him, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? 
it, painful as that, as that may be, God's just like, you know what? I'm with you. I care about you. I'll never stop. If you, if you can let go of all that, if you can turn your back on what's destroying you, if you can turn away from that very thing that you've been loyal to, that loyalty to the things of this world, the loyalty to the opulence or, or to some sort of success that you think you've attained. You see, even the prodigal turned his back on his poor choices in the pig pit. Moses turned his back on the palace in order to walk in the plan of God. Stop being loyal to what's keeping you from fully serving God. You're going to have to find your time to turn. And as I read it, that rich young ruler had to turn and walk away sorrowfully. He turned his back on Jesus. Can I ask you, is what you've got really worth being loyal to over God? Is is what you've attained and the status and the fact that a couple of people know who you are and like you or you got a couple of pennies in the bank and you got food. Is, is that really worth not being faithful to God? Not being submitted? Not being just the, 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 the best saint of God he ever created? Stop being loyal to what's labeled you unworthy or even unnecessary. Some of you sit there and go, I guess I'm just not needed anymore. They're not using me. God called Gideon out. Don't go there with God. Turn away from your past. Move forward diligently in God's instructions. Become disloyal to what's destroying you. Walk away from your bitterness. Walk away from, from that pain that happened. Man, that happened 10 years ago. That, that happened five years. That, that, that was months ago. And you're still crying. You're still bitter about that? Gideon, you're more than that, son. You're more than you think you are. Because when you're obedient to God, I want you to know something about us in this room. Some of us tend to devalue our strengths and overvalue our weaknesses. To such an extent that it keeps us from actually doing the good things, the righteous things that God called and planned in advance for us to do. The reason people wreck is they fail to make the turn. Life is a series of changes and challenges that if you miss the turn, you wake up and you realize, man, I spent the last 10 years messing up. It's here that Gideon begins doing the wishy-washy dance. Come on, some of y'all know you can win a dance contest with that one. How can I help anybody? How can I rescue Israel? My family is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. I'm the least likely to succeed. What are you talking to me for? And I like the fact God just kind of ignores it. It's that side. Okay, hey, you finished. Are you done with your? Yeah, come on, I remember my dad looking. At you done with your belly aching? My dad. My dad was. Listen, you gonna cry? I'm gonna give you a reason. I'm gonna give you something to cry for. I know none of you know nothing about that. I, I thought it was kind of funny. I, I, heard, I was listening to the news the other day on the radio. And they, they, someone said there's there's actually a school district talking about bringing back spanking. They gonna get some good kids up in that place. Best thing that happened to me is a good whooping from my dad. Y'all don't even know. I wish some of y'all, you ain't never been in trouble in your life. You ain't never done. You keep telling little precious they're good all the time. They turn around and walk out on you. You wonder what happened. You, I'm so, man, I look back and I, I really, the wonderful thing about this banking is when you get a good one, you don't normally forget it. I've had a few good ones in my life. <laughs> I remember trying to run from my dad one time. I'm standing, I just did so I did something so stupid, and I okay, here it comes. My dad walks out, we lived on a farm, and he, you know, he's one of those old, old military guys, reaches in his pocket, pulls out his pocket knife, reaches up to that old willow tree and clips off him. And he stands there whittling that thing, getting ready to lay into me. I had three sisters, Brother Lewis. My oldest one is standing there. And you know, when you're a little kid and you got older, so you look at them like they know everything. She looks at me and said, Oh, no, my dad knew how to give a whooping. 
And my, my, my mom is paying. My mom punched you. Sister Peaches, my sister goes, And I'm like, now you have to understand, that was pretty fast. And in my little pea brain, it sounded like good advice. <laughs> Didn't think of that. We're outside. Man, I picked up left and right, and I started putting them up and down as fast as I could. I just know I was doing Roadrunner. I was fly. And I just kind of creamed my head back, and my dad is right on my heels. <laughs> oh! I'm like, wait, wait a minute. Who is the yank? Oh, man, I go try to take a corner, and I'm trying to take that thing so sharp my legs fly off beneath me. I go sliding around the ground. My dad didn't miss a beat. He grabbed my scrawny little skinny little backside up. Oh, wait. <laughs> wait. Lay it into me. You know what? I didn't get mad at my dad. I didn't get mad at that willow. I looked at him, I said, why you tell me to run? <laughs> Some of us ought to be honest. And why did I tell myself to run from God? Why did I tell myself to, to why? you know what? I needed that whip and I needed that stride. Some of us ought to come in and go, you know, I need a, I need a good weapon sometimes to get me lined up right so I can really do what God wants me. My dad never wanted to hurt me. He knew the direction I was going would hurt me way worse than any. Will I? He said, I'm going to be with you, Gideon. And you're going to destroy the Midianites. As if fighting against one man. What? I always love God's answer to the how can I stuff. Because people when they're asked to do what seems to be impossible in their eyes. This is God said to, to Moses hundreds of years earlier. I'm going to be with you. Like he said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with thee. God says to Gideon, I'm going to be with you. Let me tell you something. God's whispering to someone today, I'm going to be with you. Come on. You make this turn, I'm going to be with you. I'm with you. You're going to defeat the Midianites as if you're fighting against one man. Understand, God with us is always a majority. It's an interesting thing that happens. I'm not going to go too much detail in here because I want to get to something. Gideon was basically replying, well, okay, I need a sign that you're really going to be. It's really you speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering. Hold up, God, I'll be back. Wow. Go read it. You stay here. I'm going to go get my offering. I'm going to go get my sacrifice. And Gideon runs off and did everything. Took the goat, made some bread, brings it back to where God was patiently waiting. I wonder how many of God's just patiently waiting on us. He put it on that rock. Gideon obeys. He's just doing it. God touches it, the tip of the staff. Flame fires up in the rock and consumes everything on the rock and just disappears. You know, Gideon had to start freaking out. You know, he had no cell phone to get. I got to get this on Facebook. Let me tell you something. You got to get past thinking all the important things are postable on Facebook. Some of you have diminished your life to nothing but momentary Posts on Facebook. That's the epitome of your experience. Gideon realized this was the angel of the Lord, and he cried out, O oh, sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Pretty much the same response that we get from Isaiah in chapter 6. The Lord says, Don't be afraid. You will not die. You have to understand something. That that was a possibility in, in the presence of God. Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named the place Jehovah Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. 
Later that night, God speaks to Gideon again. Wow, he's just got this whole conversation going. See what turning will do for you? See what turning does for you when you take the time to turn. When you, when you quit just making your weekly visit to church your only time, and you get up day in and day out, you turn to the Lord, you're going to find that like God speaks to Gideon, he'll start speaking to you again. When you start laying aside all the things that you think are so important and make God important, you're going to be surprised how much you're going to start hearing from him. And there was some stuff that Gideon needed to take care of in his home before God would fully use him as a leader to deliver his people. Listen, this is pretty cool stuff. The night, that night the Lord said to Gideon, take, listen to this, this is important. You can easily read through it. Take the second bull from your father's herd the one that is seven years old. Go read it. Throw down the altar of bow that thy father hath cut and cut down the grove that is by it and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place and take the second bullock, that one that's seven years old and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. He ain't moving forward till you cut down what's been in the way. In fact, when you finally get rid of and you finally cut down and you finally remove, that's going to give you the fuel for your fire. How many years had they been oppressed by the Midianites? How old was that bull? Put down your father's altar. Pull it down to bow. Cut down that Asherah pole and rip it down. Think about this. Are you kidding me? In his own house, there was altars to pagan gods. Can, can we be real here? How many of us have built up things that are worshipped, revered, demanded, expected, and we push God to the wayside for when it's convenient for us? But as in, all, in his own house, I wonder how long that had been there. I wonder how long Gideon had worshipped at that altar. The real question is, is how many altars do other gods are in your house? How many things that have become more important and valuable to you than the presence of the Lord? You have to be honest spiritually with God. Your, your flesh may not want to or agree. But God is like, listen, after you rip that stuff down, here's what I want you to do. You build an altar to the Lord your God right here. You lay, the, you, you, you lay those stones carefully. You sacrifice that bull on the, on, on the altar. You use the, 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 as fuel the wood from that pole that you just cut down. You want the power of God, Gideon? You really want the power of God? How, how many really want the power of God back in your life? I, I wonder, is there a saint of God here? See, I love it. Gideon, I want you to take the false gods that you and your family have been worshiping and use it as kindling for your sacrifice to me. That's the only God. Oh, no, 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 no. You, 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 you want to move forward to me? Then I, I want that. God ain't playing. God ain't playing. So Gideon, two weeks later, a year later, Ten years late? No. That very night. That very night. See, that's just it. How many of us will all get to it? I'm just not ready to let go of that yet. And I just, you know, no. That's that's got a lot of value. I just can't just just that's you better hear me. He took some servants with him and he went and did it. I'm realizing he took people with him that there were other people worshiping as well at those things. I wonder how many people we lead astray to the things that we worship in our house that we have in our lives. And I, I, I get it. I'm not trying to meddle in anybody's life. I'm not. You decide. You make those decisions. I'll, I'm just, I'm just presenting to you the opportunity to turn.
Because the next morning when the people of the town see that the altar to Baal has been demolished and the pole of Asherah has been cut down and there's a new altar built in its place with using that stuff, they were furious. They were furious. Don't you, you, you touch my stuff. You touched what was valuable to me. You, you, who gave you the right? And sometimes we can't do what God wants us to do because we let people have a greater influence in us than the word and will of God. And so Gideon had to do something many of us need to do to please God. He had to let go of trying to please everybody else. He had to let go of doing everything everybody else felt he had to do. He, he finally had to realize, you don't understand something. I've been face to face with God. I, I know I'm the least, and I know I, I'm not supposed to be the one to stand up and do anything. I'm not supposed to be the one in here that matters. I, that's something for, 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 for Brother Joe to do or, or for Brother Crow to do. Let, 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 the, oh, let, let, let the, the anointed ones do it. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Gideon did something a lot of people don't. Gideon did something that set him up spiritually way more than what matters physically. He let go of what made him insignificant. And God made him the most important dude on the block. He finally cut down when nobody else would cut down. He finally stood up when nobody else would. He finally did what no one would do. Israel had backslid. And finally, the least man in the least tribe stood up. The least like it. We're going to cut down this stuff that's keeping us from God. We're going to rip this. It ain't coming in my house. It ain't coming in my life. Here's Gideon, the lowest guy on the totem pole, becoming one of the all-time great leaders. That's what an encounter with God can do for you. That's what can happen when you finally get to the place with God. You find yourself in an altar and you say, it's time for me to turn. It's time for me to turn. Gideon is often criticized for fleecing God. I've done it. I preached it. That joker, that lily livered, lint back. Well, but let me say this. You can't fleece God if you're not talking to him. And you're not talking to him unless you believe in him. him. And, it, and if you're fleecing God and giving some things up, that means you're getting ready to trust. Gideon's greatest moment began when we became disloyal to what he used to be. If you can become disloyal to your yesterday, you got a great tomorrow. Oh, you got to become disloyal to what you used to worship, to what you used to make important. Letting things go often releases you, allowing you to go into something greater. So they find out it's Gideon who did this, and a mob forms. Come on, everybody's upset. They go to Joash, they go into his house, send out your boy. We're killing him for doing this. Judges 6, 30 and 31. Then the men of the city said to Joash, Bring out thy son that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of thou. These are God's people wanting to kill a man of God who finally stood up and did what should have been done a long time ago. Gideon finally did what no man in the whole tribe had ever done. And they want to kill him. And Joah said, and all that stood against him, will you plead for Baal? He finally, he, Gideon's dad, finally woke up and got a revelation. How many of us plead for stuff? Let that stuff plead for itself. Will you save him? Go save Baal. He that will plead for him, let him be put to death. If he be God, let him plead for himself. Because one hath cast down his altar. Joash basically shouted to the mob that confronted him. Why are you defending Baal? Will you argue this ungodly case? Whoever will plead this case, let him be put to death today, this morning. If Baal is truly God, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down. Come on, Baal, get up and kill Gideon. Isn't it funny we want to kill the Gideons? Pastor making me mad. He's preaching about stuff. 
You got a, you got a teenager coming in your house saying, come on, Dad. Come on, Mom. Let's turn that junk off. Stop drinking that. Stop smoking that. We got kids. They are not want to live for God and parents holding on to them. What's interesting and important is we see Gideon's dad finally stepping up. He finally recognizes what his son did. And he realizes it was something he should have done a long time ago. Isn't it funny that when we're, when we're backslid in our heart and we got other things more important, our, it's easy to cut down the preacher. It's easy to cut down a man of God doing something that we know we should have done. And so rather than saying, you know what, I should have done that, let me get with him. We want to just throw some shade on him a little bit. No, I'm not against him, but I'm not with him. Oh, I'm showing up, but I ain't going with the program. See, Gideon's dad even shows us what it means to turn. Even Gideon's dad, well, when it's right in front of your face, it's time to turn. <laughs> he stands by, he finally stands by his son. Remember, Gideon just tore down everything he had, everything he worshipped, everything he valued. Gideon walked in and took everything that dad had and ripped it. He took his prize bull and shot his, his, yeah, there's some, that was money back then. And he burned. He was honest. And he realized, my God, my son, my son's doing what I should have done. And so instead of fighting his son, he jumped up on Gideon's side. You ain't touching that guy. He finally did. So I should have done it, but I didn't. But you ain't touching him now. He finally did what I should have done a long time ago. Thank you. You want to be thankful for the people in your life that will stand up for stuff that you're limp wristing it on. You ought to thank God for someone that don't talk about a standard, but really holds one. Someone that's showing up for prayer on time. Don't you cut it down. Start showing up on time. Someone reading their Bible. Don't criticize it. Start reading your Bible. Someone teaching Bible study. Don't say you got, ain't got time. Throw down the altars of hell and find some time. Oh, I know that ain't popular. You see, God knew what he was doing. He called a Gideon because he knew if he got Gideon, dad's got the opportunity to get a revelation. You know what? What am I doing? Let me stand by. Let me stand by my son. Because if he didn't, the tribe would have been divided and no one would have recognized. They'd have killed each other. The church would have been divided. There would have been nothing but carnage. The church would have been stuck. All because dad didn't get in line with the son that was doing what he should have done. That was stepping in and risking it all. And he realized, oh my God, he had the guts to do what I didn't. I ain't going to get mad. I'm going to stand with him. Oh, we ought to thank the Lord right now. Come on, man. I promise, stand with your boys around here. Stand with your sons around here. We need some godly men in here. We got some young men praying in this house. We got some young people worshiping. Get with them. Don't criticize them. Here's this father realizing, being in unity with his son, who was doing God's will, was more important than anything he had ever done in his life. It mattered more than who he'd ever been, anything he'd ever accumulated, any accolade he ever got. He had to understand his legacy lied and how we got with his son. So when you get to the story, you have to understand the Midianites were coming in to rob. They crossed the road Jordan River and they come sweeping into Israel. 135,000 warriors getting ready to pillage and raid. But they didn't know things were different in, the, in town. You see, I understand something. You better get with the will and the plan of God when he starts, when it's time to turn. He knows there's an enemy coming. You better get with the Gideons. You better get, get with Gideon's dad. The Bible says, Judges 6 and 34, that he blew a ram's horn to call everyone to arms. You have to understand, there's a time when we got we to realize it's time to fight the enemy. 
You see, everybody got to still be, well, bless God, they throw down the growth. Bless God, they do, man, they're doing this now, and now they're doing that over there, and they're doing this, and I don't like this, and I don't like the carpet, and I don't like the paint color. I don't, how come I don't have a spot with my name on it? How come this? You see, when you turn, you need to turn. And so Mr. Winepress, he's still kind of new with his warrior stuff, this leadership thing. <laughs> hey, boys. You hang in there. We, we got you. We're with you. Gideon still kind of learned this thing, you know. He, he's still got all that practice in the wine press. He don't understand that. He's, he's doing this out in the open. It, we're going this way, guys. He's talking to the Lord. And Gideon wakes up the next morning. And he deals with the fleeces. And he goes through that. And he says to all our all-powerful, ever-patient, and aren't you glad, God? Please don't angry with me. I'm going to do one more test. Now, 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 I want the fleece. Once I want the fleece to be dry when it's wet, then I want the fleece to be wet when it's dry. But he's talking to God, ain't he? We got to allow people that have made that turn to find their bearings with God. See, Gideon is the leader. And a very unlikely leader with a victory. What are some things that make a victory on a battlefield more possible? Superior weapons and superior forces. Chapter 7 of Judges is where he wins his victory. But you have to understand, it was with some pretty unusual and unlikely weapons. Gideon's army was 32,000. And it's about to face off against the Midianites and a coalition army of 135,000. I'm, I'm going to go quick here. Gideon's army is camped at the spring of Herod, and the Midianite coalition was camped north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. Listen, God's people are outnumbered at this point, four to one. Now, those aren't good odds. So I'm sure Gideon was kind of concerned. He might have been looking for. Who's that wine breast at? <laughs> but his level's about to go up a few notches. Let me. You got someone with the guts enough to lead. Thank, thank you, Sister Erica, for, for yeah. doing what you did today in the music. Yeah. It's hard to just say, you know, I'm going to take a hold of this thing. And thank God for people that take on a Sunday school class. Thank God for that person that take on the youth department. Thank God for people who teach a Bible study and be thank God for those people that study. It's not always easy. And so the Lord spoke to you and said, you know, there's just too many of you. Do we need to go back to that policing thing, God? Because uh, excuse me? Come again? I misheard you. you, you we have too many? Too many of what? How, how can an army have too many when we're already outnumbered? You have to understand, if I let, let you all fight the Midianites, even though it's four to one, the Israelites, you see, there's something about our nature. You'll say you saved yourselves by your own strength. Now, I know nobody in here battles that. Our God is very generous. I'm going to tell you there's something he's not going to share. His glory. Gideon is instructed to tell the people, whoever is timid or afraid, y'all just head on home. That's kind of funny to me. Because they didn't have any homes. They was living in a den and caves. You know, he said, go back to your cave. The irony there is, you know what a wine press kind of looks like? Those of you, if you don't ever get a wine press experience, you're going to be going back to your cave. You're going to go back to who you've always been. You don't, don't, don't get mad at people that stepped out of the cave. You ought to say, you know what, man, they done it. They did what I could. No, no, don't look down on someone that, that came out of drugs. They did it. Don't, don't, don't get up at someone who laid down cigarettes. They did it. Don't, don't get up at someone who come out of the world. They did it. You ought to turn around and realize that God can do if you're willing to turn. Basically, not everybody on the mountain can stay. 
Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned to the people twenty and two thousand. And there, what? Hold up. You said we're too many. Lord, 22,000. They split. You know, you have to understand something. This is deeper than just a situation because this is part of the law that God gave Moses to write down for. This is, this is a command here. You just can't split. You don't have a right to just bail out because it says in Deuteronomy, 20, when you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them because the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt will be with you. You can't leave. You have to ask yourself, do you bail out when it gets tough? Do you, do you, do you, oh, it gets a little tough. Oh, no, I'm not going to be a part of that. Let's stand back and see if they succeed. You know, oh, leave me out of this. Oh, let, let, no, no, let, 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 you're on your own. Remove those carnal and fearful folks before it spreads. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He made an offering, 22,000 bailed out. Not everybody that shows up early wants to sacrifice and fight. The crowd was gone, and now you have the courageous. Wait a minute. How do you think Gideon felt as he saw two-thirds of his army leave? Discouraged, afraid, disheartened, disillusioned? Do you think he took it personally? I know my proclivities. Oh, yeah. I'll be seeing who's here tonight. I know I'll take it personally. How would you feel if you, you were doing something you invite everybody over and half of us don't come? How do you think those other 999 9,999 felt. They're watching. Wait a minute, guys. You already know where, I'm at. where, where are you going? What, you can't stand? I thought, I thought we all were in the same boat. I thought we were. You see, the odds just went from 4 to 1 to 3.5 to 1. And there are still too many men. Say, what? 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 Wait, did you just? Now, I recognize the voice, but I don't recognize what you're saying. Come on, somebody. You, you, you get to that place with God, and next thing you know, he's asking you to do more. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out. Now, some people, let me tell you why I feel he did this, because I kind of feel like it's semantics, but exactly. The day you stop thinking that the little things that you do and don't do, they matter. Amen. Your thinking matters. Your attitude matters. What you say matters. The little things yes. matter. Well, they don't even know if I'm not there. They don't even know. I'm not. Let me just give the pastor a little warm pat. That was a good little sermon. Oh, look, the little youth apart. This little test. This little thing. Why would it matter? Let me tell you something. Who are we to say what matters to God when he's trying to get the right ones? If God isn't just, just going to do it your way. He's going to do it his way. And the Lord told Gideon, it's with these 300 that I will rescue you and give you victory. See all these guys here? Send them home. What do you think was going through Gideon's head when he laid his tent, laid his self down in his tent that night? He's going up against an army of 135,000. And I got 300? Hold on, Lord, I'm not getting this. But I've learned to say, what are you teaching me, Lord? And I got to believe Gideon said, what are you, what are you showing me? Because there's a constant in all of this. It's those who made the right turn versus those who didn't. Those who let the little things pull them out of service at the wrong time and those who make decisions, I can't miss this. 
those who make the decision to be a prayer on time and ah, little things they add up, they stack up, they matter. You can't deny that Gideon to all those other men and all those years. Those groves didn't get set up in a day. Those altars didn't give you that. It took seven years to get that bull. It matters what you do on a daily basis. It matters how you act. How you speak. You didn't backslide over one little thing that something got in you and it ate away. And it tore away and it ripped away. And let me tell you what, the wonderful thing is all those little things can tear you out, but it's one turn to get you right back. But you got to make the turn. And the simple difference was those that made the right turn. Those that made the turn. Go down to the camp. I want you to hear something. Take Pura and go down there and listen to what they're talking about. If you could only hear how the enemy talks about those of you making the right turns. If you could just hear the enemy right now getting upset. Get, shut that preacher up. Shut, don't let him go to church with that message today. Don't let him tell someone that if they make the right turn. Don't, don't, don't. Yeah, yeah. Ah, someone's back. I got them bound up. I got them convinced. I got them completely demoralized. Don't tell them all they got to do is turn. And he's listening, and you know what? We have a dream, but the enemy's got a nightmare. I had a dream that this loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midian camp. You got beat up by bread? That's, my God. I have dreams about lions and tigers and crazy things. Let me summarize this. God divides 300 men. Gideon divides 300 men into three companies of 100. And the ridiculous is they surround the enemy with 300. And they go to battle with trumpets and torches. Y'all think Gideon's nuts. Gideon lost his mind. Where'd, where'd, where'd them 9,700 go? <laughs> signals these men to blow their trumpet, smash their trumpets, hold their torches in their hands, and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Let me tell you something. We know the Lord's doing a work, but he's looking for a Gideon. I wonder if we got any Gideons here today. I wonder if we got someone here that you know what? If he can do it, forget him. Is there anybody here that's ready for God to use you? Wait, 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 wait. Okay, okay. Let's, let, let's go ahead and stand. I'm going to wrap this up. But let me give you some questions. Does God still need leaders? Does God still want victories to be won that will bring him glory? Now, this is a little personal, and it might be presumptuous, but considering our conversation today, it's in order. Is there anyone in the room that wants to be a leader? Is there anybody in the room that wants to be a better disciple than they've ever been? Is there anybody here that wants to minister for God? Is there anybody here that wants to win some victories for God and for his glory and for his kingdoms? Now, now, now I don't know about you, but I can answer yes to every one of those. I believe God is still bringing victory to people, turning people's lives around, restoring people. Can I share with you what I learned? If God calls you and speaks to you, turn and listen. Yes. Don't run around and tell everybody else what they need to do. Go to your house and do what you need to do. Amen. Go tear down some junk. Get rid of the, start with the junk in your own life first. 
Don't, don't, don't go and think you're going to preach and bark to others when you got some altars that need to come. You, you, you got some idols in your own house, in your own life. There, things that are way more important than the house of God. Start with the junk in your own life first. Tear down any altars in your life that need to come down. Are there any poles of Asherah that need to cut down in your life? He'll walk with you. He'll be with you through every one of them. See, it's never been about what you have, but it's been about who is God in your life. It's not the size of the enemy or the obstacles that you face as an individual today, but it's in the presence and power of your God. Numbers are irrelevant to victory when God is on your side and you follow his plan. Someone, you need to get out of that wine press today. You need to stop avoiding the Holy Ghost and the altar. You need to come like you ain't come in years. You need to run out of it. God, I want to be used. I want back in the will of God like never before. I'm ready to stand with Gideon. I'm ready to stand with the kingdom of God. It always comes down to this. And I open this altar. Will you turn towards God or turn away? See, because listen, I remember Lot's wife, we know, turn back. But let me tell you what, there's way more that turn forward. I'm thankful for the Noahs, the Moses, the Daniels, the Ruth, the Elishas, the disciples, and Esther. All turn to follow the Lord. This altar's open right now. Will you turn? It's time for you to turn.